Hey everyone, I think the narrative of abstract math being inapplicable is something that gets thrown around a lot. Jokes aside, today's topic is a perfect example of this. In the 1800s, Evariste Galois published a paper outlining an algebraic structure called a Galois field and its applications in number theory, which can get really abstract. Despite this, Galois fields are foundational today in internet security, from cryptography to today's topic, error correction codes. Let's say I'm trying to send some data from my computer to my friend Tony's computer. Here I'm sending four packets with one integer each. In an ideal world, we send these packets no problem. But typically there is some interference between the two computers. In particular, what if one of these packets gets dropped, and Tony's computer only receives three packets? Is there some way we can add some extra redundant data that will help us recover the original data if it gets lost? In the example we'll cover today called read Solomon codes, we add an extra k packets, so for example two extra packets, and we'll be able to recover all the original data from any four of these packets. So for instance, I can drop one of the original packets containing the number 3 in one of the error correction packets and recover the original data from these four packets. And here you can also see the trade-off we have to make with choosing the amount of error correction packets. The more packets, the more data you have to send. The less packets, a higher probability you have of losing the data. In other words, the choice k represents the maximum amount of packets we can lose. Today, Reed Solomon codes are widely used in CDs, DVDs, barcodes, and more. Have you ever noticed how a scratched up CD is still readable, or how even a partially scanned barcode is still valid? This is the math behind that. But before we talk about how Reed Solomon codes work, we have to introduce some seemingly unrelated topics. Bear with me though, they all come beautifully together in the end. One of the things Galois studied was modular arithmetic. Essentially, when we perform addition and multiplication, we do them mod some prime number p. We say two numbers a and b are congruent mod p if they have the same remainder after dividing by p. For instance, 1 is equivalent to 6 mod 5, since they have remainder 1 when dividing by 5. Let's work with only integers for this video. How would addition work here? To add numbers in mod space, we would just add the numbers first and then take the remainder after. For instance, let's consider 3 plus 3 mod 5. We first take 3 plus 3, giving us 6, and then take mod 5, giving us 1. You can think of modular addition to be on a circle, with p evenly spaced numbers. For example, with addition mod 5, it gives us this circle. Let's try 4 plus 3. Starting at 4, we move 3 steps clockwise, giving us 2. Notice, the effect of doing mod 5 constrains the outputs to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and any integer is equivalent to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. In other words, this operation is closed. This also gives us an intuition for what subtraction would do. Let's try 1 minus 3. Starting at 1, we move 3 steps counterclockwise, giving us 3. You can also think of subtraction as adding the additive inverse of a number. This would mean changing 1 minus 3 to 1 plus minus 3, where minus 3 is the additive inverse of 3. But what exactly is minus 3 mod 5? Let's consider a number a and its additive inverse minus a. The definition of an additive inverse is that a plus minus a equals 0. So in modular arithmetic, we're looking for a number that when added to itself returns 0. Let's go back to 1 plus minus 3. The additive inverse of 3 is 2, since 3 plus 2 mod 5 is equivalent to 0. And so 1 minus 3 mod 5 is the same as 1 plus minus 3 mod 5, which is the same as 1 plus 2 mod 5 giving us the same answer 3. Similarly, we can do multiplication mod p, where we multiply the numbers out and then take mod p. So for instance, 2 times 3 is 6, mod 5 is 1. On the circle, this is the same as adding 2 3 times, since 2 times 3 is 2 plus 2 plus 2.
And finally, we define division similar to subtraction by multiplying by the multiplicative inverse. Here, the multiplicative inverse A inverse can be defined as A times A inverse is equal to 1. Let's try 4 divided by 2. The multiplicative inverse of 2 is 3, since 2 times 3 mod 5 is 1. So 4 divided by 2 is 4 times 3, which is 2. If the number p we're performing modular by is not prime, then all numbers don't have multiplicative inverses. For instance, 2 does not have a multiplicative inverse mod 4. Modular arithmetic is hard to get used to, since the symbols for each of the operations is the same as regular arithmetic. But amazingly, even though the results are completely different, the rules they follow are identical to regular arithmetic. This means that algebra I do over the real numbers can be applied to modular arithmetic as well. The formal term for this fact is saying that they form a field. I encourage you to pause and think about examples for each of these rules to get used to modular arithmetic and convince yourself that they work. Let's consider a seemingly unrelated question. Given a list of coordinates x and y, how can we come up with a polynomial that goes through all of these coordinates? The method I'll be showing you today is called Lagrange interpolation, which gives a polynomial of degree n minus 1 for n number of coordinates. Let's consider three coordinates, 1, 2, 3, 2, and 4, negative 1. What we're trying to find is a degree 2 polynomial, a quadratic, that goes through each of these points. The first step is to consider three different polynomials, called Lagrange polynomials, that equal 1 at each x-coordinate and equal 0 at every other x-coordinate. So for instance, this first polynomial equals 1 at x is equal to 1, but equals 0 at x is equal to 3 and x is equal to 4. Similarly, the second polynomial equals 1 at x is equal to 3 and equals 0 at x is equal to 1 and x is equal to 4. And lastly, the third polynomial equals 1 at x is equal to 4, but equals 0 at x is equal to 1 and x is equal to 3. Let's try and construct the first Lagrange polynomial, which we can denote with L1x. First, we can set the zeros to be the other x coordinates, giving us x minus 3 times x minus 4. To make it equal 1 at x is equal to 1, we first plug in x is equal to 1, giving us 6, then dividing the polynomial by this number. This gives us the first Lagrange polynomial, 1 sixth times x minus 3 times x minus 4. Doing this for all the other points, we get three Lagrange polynomials. And now, to get the final polynomial, we can multiply each Lagrange polynomial by each y-coordinate and sum them together You can see how this isolates every coordinate point, since li of x equals 0 at every other point except xi. This gives us a systematic way of coming up with the polynomial of degree n minus 1 that goes through a given n points. A super important fact about this polynomial is that it is unique. That is, there is one and only one polynomial of degree n minus 1 that goes through these n points. We can prove this using contradiction. Consider n distinct points, labeled xi, yi, for i going from 1 to n. Let's assume that the polynomial of degree n minus 1 satisfying these points isn't unique, and that there are two distinct polynomials p of x and q of x of degree n minus 1, such that p of x of i is equal to q of x of i is equal to y of i. Let's consider a polynomial r of x is equal to p of x minus q of x. Since p of x and q of x are distinct, r of x is not going to be 0. And we know that since p of x and q of x are of degree n minus 1, and since we know that p of x and q of x are degree n minus 1, the maximum degree of r of x is n minus 1. This means that r of x has at most n minus 1 roots. But we know that for all x of i, r of x of i is equal to p of x of i minus q of x of i, which is 0. And given that we have n different points, this gives us n roots, which is a contradiction. 
The key fact that brings modular arithmetic and Lagrange interpolation together is that we can actually perform Lagrange interpolation using modular arithmetic. Given that our setup for Lagrange interpolation only requires addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and since we also know that they follow the same rules as regular arithmetic, we can actually use Lagrange interpolation with modular arithmetic. Keep in mind though, calculations for polynomials are completely different. Let's consider a polynomial f of x is equal to x squared plus 2 with modular arithmetic mod 5. The typical visual for this polynomial is some quadratic equation, but I want you to toss that away and think of polynomials as a function. To plot this polynomial, we can consider the set of all inputs and the set of all outputs. Given that the set of inputs and outputs are finite, we can actually plot this entire function over this field. And well, this looks entirely different to the function over real numbers. We've defined a whole new number system. Now, how is this useful to us? Let's put this all together and talk about Reed Solomon codes. This is a beautiful application of polynomials and modular arithmetic. We start with the setup discussed in the intro two computers and some packets containing a number each, which we wish to send over from one computer to another. We start by setting a number k, which is the maximum number of packets we can afford to lose. Let's set k is equal to 2, adding an extra 2 packets to our already 4 packets. We'll also assume that each of these packets contains a label, starting at 1, so even if you lose, say, the 4th packet, you still know that the 5th packet is the 5th packet. Let's label our 6 packets M1 to M6. We start by choosing a large prime number P, such that P is greater than all the numbers contained in each of the packets. Now assume that all the arithmetic we do is mod this prime number P. We then use Lagrange interpolation mod P to construct a polynomial f of x such that f of 0 is equal to m1, f of 1 is equal to m2, f of 2 is equal to m3, and f of 3 is equal to m4. Since p is greater than all of m of i, they are preserved. Given this polynomial, we assign m5 and m6 to be f of 4 and f of 5 respectively. Now we send our packets m1 to m6 to the other computer. Let's assume m2 and m5 are lost. Since the polynomial constructed by the first four packets is unique, if we were to use Lagrange interpolation on the packets received by the other computer, we must end up with the same polynomial. And finally, we can plug in 0, 1, 2, 3 into our constructed polynomial to retrieve our original data. Amazing, isn't it? Let's try an example. Consider trying to send 2, 4, 3, and 1 from one computer to another. We start with the Lagrange interpolation mod 5, giving us the polynomial f of x is equal to 2x cubed plus 2. Let's try it out. Plugging in x is equal to 0, we get f of 0 is equal to 2, f of 1 is equal to 4, f of 2 is equal to 18, which mod 5 is 3, f of 3 is equal to 56, which mod 5 is 1. Now, we plug in x is equal to 4 and x is equal to 5 into the polynomial, which is 0 and 2 respectively. Now, we send these 6 packets over. Let's assume we lost packet 1 and packet 6. We now perform Lagrange interpolation on the same remaining packets, giving us the same polynomial as before. After this, we plug in x is equal to 0, 1, 2, and 3 to retrieve the original values. One thing. It's not entirely obvious why modular arithmetic is useful here, but notice that from doing modular arithmetic, all our numbers are constrained to 0 to p minus 1. Why is this useful? Well, if from interpolation our error correcting packets have some absurdly large value, it makes it hard to coordinate sending all the data. Modular arithmetic solves this problem. If there's anything you take away from this video, it's that as an engineer, pure math isn't something to ignore. Often mathematicians come up with theorems with no immediate usage. When Galois published his paper on Galois theory, it was more or less proving results constrained to pure math itself. 
It said that Augustin Louis Cauchy, who reviewed Galois' paper, saw the significance of his work. However, little did either of them know how useful his work would be in information theory and cryptography, fields that hadn't even been invented at the time. It takes a second pair of eyes to apply these abstract results to a field of your speciality. It's up to you whether you choose to be that second pair of eyes or not. This video was sponsored by Brilliant, an interactive website for math and STEM education. There are two main courses I want to show you today. The first is their group theory course, which is an introduction to abstract algebra, the study of fields like the ones discussed in this video, and other abstract structures, like groups and rings and so on. The other is the number theory course, that has a section that goes over modular arithmetic, in significantly more detail and with applications than I did. Brilliant's value here is that they provide a great addition to watching explanatory videos online through their interactive question answer style. Watching videos isn't enough to learn a topic, you must interact and solve problems too. So if you're interested, you can go to my link to brilliant.org slash vkbingx and sign up for free, and let them know that you came from me. In addition, the first 200 people to sign up using my link get 20% off their annual subscription. Once again, thank you to Brilliant for their support. Thank you.